Okay then, ladies and gentlemen, so here we are in our last class now. Um, the next time we actually see each other now will be absolutely in the final exam. Um, I was a little bit unsure about the schedule, the change of the schedule. It gets changed so many times. I get so many emails about the changes that it's difficult to keep track. But it will be, uh, there will be no class. It will be the last class. Uh, there will be no uh, class next class, next Friday, sorry, because uh, of Dragon Boat Festival. So this is actually the last class here that we've got now. So uh, we're going to have a look, um, as the uh, title says, the language and culture in the classroom. Kind of an interesting little look at uh, the way that the, especially from a Chinese point of view, um, in higher education at least, uh, the way that uh, attitudes uh, differ between uh, the relationship between uh, students and teachers. So it should be an interesting, uh, an interesting look. So we'll get straight into uh, having a look at the uh, vocabulary here. We, it's, it's impossible to uh, have a discussion uh, uh, without uh, talking about these three guys. Um, Aristotle, not so much as, as, as influential as Socrates or Plato. Uh, Socrates, just be aware of the Greek the Greek pronunciation here, we have the long E sound, Socrates. Um, it's not Socrates, as you might imagine it to be uh, in the English pronunciation. Um, we, have, we always have to, even if there is a word from a foreign language, uh, the pronunciation does differ a lot. So, for example, uh, when we have French words that are in English, such as uh, invention, T-I-O-N. Um, it just changes pronunciation a little bit to invention. So the uh, stress is on the second syllable. Uh, a lot of English pronunciation is inconsistent because of this, so we can't really see a connection uh, between the written English and uh, the way that we actually pronounce the word because the word may come from uh, another language and may be um, pronounced slightly differently. So here we have, we don't have Socrates. We actually have to say Socrates. Um, same with Plato. There are two long, long vowel sounds here. It's not Plato. Actually, Plato is uh, a completely different word. You'll be able to look it up in the dictionary. A plateau, meaning a, um, a flat piece of land. Um, it's uh, again, E A U. This is uh, the French, the French word. So it's not this name here. Plato is not pronounced plateau. It's pronounced plateau. Plateau is a completely different word. So it's only through um, having a wide vocabulary that you would actually know that. So be aware of pronunciations, they are quite specific and it's not really, um, you're not really able to uh, guess them from the written language. Listening is important. Uh, Aristotle that we have here, um, we have a, an interesting, just an interesting um, kind of uh, pronunciation point here. When we have this um, consonant and le we have to make sure that there is no uh, vowel sound between the two so uh, we need to talk about the syllabi in the pronunciation of words like temple um, there is not temple there is no it's not temple it is temple so we go straight to the l sound so uh, words like temple words like simple we need to make sure that we, we don't add a vowel sound from the P to the L. There is no P to the L vowel. It just goes straight to, from the P to the L. So stottle, there is no stottle. It's stottle. A temple is not temple. 
it's temple. And simple is not simple, it's simple. So we need to make sure that we're keeping the vowel sound to a minimum between the P and the L or the T and the L. So there is no vowel sound. So there's no vowel sound from the consonant to the LE sound, the L sound. So temple, simple, Aristotle. So there's no so just a, a pr pr pronunciation note there for you. And finally, we have this um, Confucius here. Um, the uh, this is what we call either. Um, th there's a number of different ways of uh, of uh, describing this. Um, it's a, either a. Let's get the uh, pen up here. It's a, a Latinization, a Romanization, or West Westernization. Um, of the name, of the Chinese name. Um, it's important to learn that these, uh, these uh, occasionally strange uh, ways of uh, kind of these, these corruptions of uh, foreign words that often come in. It's not, um, it's not a, uh, what's the opposite of common? The word I'm trying to say. It's not that they are particularly um, stupid people when they actually, um, they actually hear these words. It's just basically, um, you can't hear sounds you don't know. So um, there are 46 sounds in the English language. So we in native English speakers know 46 sounds. It's around 46 sounds. Um, but when we, um, when we hear foreign words, um, those foreign words will have um, sounds that we don't recognize. And when we don't recognize them, uh, we can't hear them. So um, it, it's important to practice the sounds pronouncing them so that you're able to pronounce them and uh, recognize them. Otherwise, you end up with words like this, where we have um, Kong Fu Zhe, which is the, uh, the Chinese name for this guy. Uh, and that ends up being um, corrupted. So we have a, a corruption of, so we talk about a corruption of um, a certain word, um, Confucius. Um, where the whole name is reduced down to uh, one word or one name. So oftentimes when people can't hear uh, the word, the sounds that exist in a foreign language but don't exist in their own language, they, they literally can't hear them at all. So um, we end up with these um, strange corruptions. Of, um, of foreign words, just simply because some sounds get lost. So we have what, what we call corrupted uh, pronunciation. Um, oftentimes we'll, um, when we have one, one name for someone, you'll notice there's there's no family name here. No, nobody's ever questioned this in English. Uh, when we have this, uh, we just have the word Confucius and we just assume he's, he's, he's called Confucius when clearly he needs to have a, for, uh, needs to have a, form, a family name. We call this a mononym um, with uh, the word mono meaning one. So we have mono and stereo. And a mononym is just basically a single name for someone. Um, it's mostly celebrities um, that we will have uh, choose to have a uh, a single word referring to them. So, um, for example, there's a singer, or there was a singer called Prince. Um, he's a singer. Um, we have um, Iman. He's a model, and they just re refer to professionally usually just as uh, one name, and we call this a mononym. It was probably more common in the 1960s uh, that people uh, 
people would just try to think of one recognizable name. But um, Confucius is a corruption of the Chinese. Uh, Kong Fu is a, uh, created uh, by people who couldn't really hear the sounds of, uh, of uh, Chinese uh, speaking. So Socrates lends his name to a method of education, and it is uh, basically very very simple. We use um, we use um, ic as the suffix here. So we take off the um, the es form. And to create a noun again, we have to follow the rules of uh, Greek grammar here, unfortunately. So, Greek grammar is all about suffixes and prefixes, um, where we have the es is given in the noun form, but the ic it becomes an adjective. Um, the Socratic method of teaching is basically um, teaching through questioning. And the idea is that um, students develop their critical thinking skills as much and uh, logical reasoning as much as they gain knowledge. So the teacher will fill in the gaps and remind people, but um, they will never actually, the teacher will never actually, or very rarely, give a direct answer to a question. So, for example, the student might ask, why is the sky blue so the student so the student will ask the teacher why is the sky blue and then the teacher will say well first of all what is blue and then uh, the, stu the student will say it's a color and then the teacher will say so how do we see colors and the student will say, we see the reflected color. And so on and so on and so on. And then the, uh, so what is reflected in the sky? And then we go and we go and the, the, there will be some guidance from the teacher, um, but um, there will be um, a series of questions between uh, the student and the teacher as the teacher aims to guide the thinking so that the student will, first of all, uh, will understand and second of all, will be able to develop the critical thinking skills. Uh, to reinforce a theoretical idea into a practical idea. So uh, whether he kind of uh, knew this or not, Socrates has an had an understanding that what you understand, uh, you rarely forget. So if you understand something thoroughly, backwards and forwards, and you're able to apply the concept both from the theory to the practical, um, it's very, very difficult for you to actually forget what you understand. So uh, as you develop an understanding of the world around you and you understand how the world works, um, you, you very, very rarely forget these things. So you understand why something has to be done. You understand how something works. And um, through, clear ex through clear questioning, and through um, building on ideas that have been learned previously in classes, um, complex ideas, um, uh, we have a series of questions which lead us through uh, a complex idea so that we learn every step of the way. Uh, the idea was that we needed to have, Socrates had this idea that um, a country needed good leaders in order to uh, be prosperous and for people to vote for those good leaders we needed to have an educated population with strong critical thinking skills uh, so that we would be able to identify um, politicians who uh, 
don't have our best interests at heart, maybe someone like Hitler. So you see the uh, the system failing in that regard. So uh, when we see people like Stalin or we see people like Hitler uh, coming to power, then we have a failure in critical thinking. And the idea was that the Socratic method uh, develops logical reasoning and critical thinking. And uh, we have an educated population and uh, things can only get better from there. The reason was that in Socrates' time, we had a group of people called the, the Sophists. And the, these guys were more interested in wordplay rather than logical reasoning. Um, so we would say, they would say something like, um, a student would ask a sophist and say, does everyone dream? So a fairly reasonable question, does everybody dream every night when they go to sleep? And the sophists would, would say, well, not everyone sleeps at night, you fool. Um, so the uh, the sophist would uh, create a, they would uh, be more interested in um, looking at the individual words and appearing to be clever and then appearing that everybody else would be stupid and everybody else would laugh at the person and they would say well not everybody sleeps at night you fool you know some people have to work at night and sleep during the day so clearly ha 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 there are some people who don't dream every night so they don't look at the the bigger picture so the words in a, in a question might not be exactly right but the, a sophist argument would uh, look at these small mistakes and then um, make people feel like idiots and the sophists were important in socrates time because they were the people they were the people who were employed as teachers they were the people making lots of money and socrates wasn't charging uh, for his classes. Uh, Socrates would uh, give his classes for free to anybody who wanted them. And the only thing was that Socrates wasn't very, wasn't very popular because he, he made the sophists look idiot, idiotic, really. And eventually um, they were able to have Socrates in prison. And unfortunately he died um, without ever writing anything down or writing a book. The only reason we know things about uh, that happened to Socrates was because Plato wrote them all down, and then Plato had the um, he had two books, uh, dialogues, which was a series of conversations between um, Socrates, Plato, and Socrates' students, and um, there was another book called The Republic, which is a, a series of dinners that Plato and Socrates had um, where they were discussing the um, the elements of a the ideal state so the ideal country with the ideal government um, they would have this philosophical discussions and they wrote these things down Socrates himself didn't write anything down um, everything that we know about Socrates is from the dialogues mostly well worth uh, getting hold of it if you can uh, if you can uh, find it on the internet, it's uh, freely available by now. And Aristotle was, um, he was a founder of the Lyceum, kind of one of the early universities, and he was actually a student of Aristotle. So from Socrates, we have the Socratic method, which is essentially the teacher questioning the student in order to help the student think more deeply about topics. Uh, using concepts that have been previously taught. Confucius, we have uh, we have the IAN suffix, which uh, takes the uh, takes the IUS noun form and changes it into an adjective. We have the um, Confucian method uh, of, of teaching the Confucian Confucian classroom. And we call this more teacher-centered. 
So the Socratic method, we would call this more student-centered, where the student is the, uh, is the focus and the attention and uh, does most of the talking and the thinking. Whereas in a Confucian classroom, we see a highly, um, almost a mirror image, completely the opposite, where we have a teacher who lectures um, a lot. Um, we, we talk about espousing, espousing the textbook, um, maybe looking at a couple of important points. Um, and essentially, the Confucius uh, method would teach towards an exam. So um, the idea is the, the um, I think I think we're all pretty much familiar with um, Confucian classrooms teaching to an exam rather than teaching to understanding. Um, missing the point that if you teach to understanding, then the exam is going to be pretty easy. So we have this um, all the way through uh, Southeast Asia. We have it in Vietnam. We have it in uh, Thailand, uh, especially in China, especially in Japan. Uh, were the uh, Confucius's early books um, uh, collected uh, collected um, lessons? I guess they're called the Analects. In uh, in English, they're called the Analects of Confucius. Um, they don't really exist. This form of writing doesn't really exist in English, so it's a little bit difficult for me to give you a to give you a name. We can't give you a name to something that doesn't exist in our language. Uh, but Confucius wrote the Analects and they are um, one of the kind of the classic texts. Uh, from ancient China that uh, unfortunately everybody was forced to learn when they were um, way back thousands of years ago you have to memorize the whole thing and then take an exam uh, anything else i can tell you um confucius didn't really became from become famous uh while he was alive unfortunately um it was only a few few years uh after he died that uh, some scholars uh kind of resurrected his ideas but uh, Unfortunately, he didn't get the recognition he deserved while he was uh, while he was alive. Okay, so we have a couple of important things here. Uh, the first that I want to point out to you is in your mind's eye, and uh, we use this to describe um, mental. mental visualizations of things so when you close your two eyes that you have your two physical eyes um, and you try to imagine or you visualize something then we say that something appears in your mind's eye um, it's just a, it's just a, um, a, mo a more um, straightforward way of talking about mental visualizations so whenever you imagine something whenever you visualize something um, we talk about something being seen in your mind's eye. Uh, rituals. This comes from the Latin, so it comes from the old, uh, the old High Italian. Confusingly, in English, we would also talk about rites, R-I-T-E-S, and um, we would be able to use them. Um, they would collocate together um, as. rites and rituals so this is one of those other confusing um, double nouns so uh, from Chaucer's time from about uh, four or five hundred years ago we talk about liberty and freedom uh, when liberty is the French word and freedom is the uh, the more anglo-saxon the more old English we do the same with rites and rituals so um, rites would be the old English and rituals would be the uh, the old Latin. Um, they mean the same thing, but they often go together like this. Just a a note about um, this this word here, this this phrase here. So let me return to the main topic.
So this is, um, <laughs> I just need to point this out because it's something that uh, university professors themselves uh, will, will uh, I'm sure you've, you've all uh, had this, I just need to teach you the opposite of this. So returning to the main topic of the lecture, um, this is, um, see if I can get this, uh, this lined in properly. So if, I have a, if I have a line, you draw a circle and then you draw a line that touches the edge of the circle. Now, I can't do it perfectly. But just to illustrate, in maths, you have a circle and then you'll have lines that go off a circle. We call this the tangent. And uh, from that, we get You'll often find this happening in uh, everyday conversation where, for example, we would have the main idea um, being the circle and then the tangent would be a line that shoots off in a random, off the, it shoots off the main idea. Um, so we often talk about, it's one of those things that has come from uh, technical language and is now found in every, everyday language. Um, to go off on a tangent is the opposite of returning to the main topic. So we're talking about the main topic and uh, talking about uh, a tangent. Um, we you, you tangent as well is the, ad, the adjective form. So when someone's gone off on a tangent, they will often say, let me return to the main topic, going back to what we were talking about. So the opposite of the main topic is a tangent. And it, uh, it comes from maths. And it's, uh, it's just one of those things that uh, describes a, um, an idea which is only loosely connected with the main topic of conversation or the lecture. Uh, take the form of, so we have um, the verb take and then the noun collocates with the form. One of those rare instances where we have the, uh, the definite article in one of these phrases. To snap your fingers, I'll just see if I can uh, find you an image of this. It's a little bit difficult to, to uh, really explain. If you take your middle finger and your, and you put your middle finger on top of your thumb, so it touches the tip of your thumb, and then you snap finger down. then you, we say that you snap your fingers. We'll see if we can find an image here. You'll, you'll see what I mean if you don't get it. So you put your, um, you can see here, you uh, you put your, um, you put your, uh, one of your, uh, your middle finger on top of your thumb, and then you, uh, and then you quickly snap down. I don't know whether you can hear that. You quickly snap down into the into your palm of your hand. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing this um, to get people's attention because, um, um, because it's uh, basically um, people used to do it when they were calling for waiters. So you uh, you wouldn't do it with uh, you wouldn't do it with a professor or anything like that. Um, uh, usually people just kind of you know um, it's it's one of those relaxing things that people do. Um, it makes an interesting sound and uh, people use it when they're listening to music. People do it when they're listening to music. Um, don't do it at people uh, because it just implies that you want them to come immediately to, to, uh, to you. You're commanding them to do something. So just be aware of that.
All right then. So, uh, in the missing words, uh, if you could take a few minutes and uh, try to imagine which words would fit in the missing spaces. Okay, so let's go through these sentences. We'll have a look at anything. Uh, I don't think there's anything too challenging at this uh, at this point of the textbook, but uh, you can listen it for the missing words, and we'll go through any um, any main features of the sentences. One, communication can take the form of talk, or it can take the form of gestures or nonverbal signals of one kind or another. Two, many scholars study the topic of communication in general and speech communication specifically in order to learn how individuals send and interpret messages. Three, one area of research in intercultural communication is the study of the influence of the setting or environment on the success or failure of communication. Four, when you are asked to picture a classroom in your mind's eye, what do you see? Five, the classroom as we know it, by the way, is a relatively recent innovation. Okay, and one more time. One, communication can take the form of talk or it can take the form of gestures or nonverbal signals of one kind or another. Two, many scholars study the topic of communication in general and speech communication specifically in order to learn how individuals send and interpret messages. Three, one area of research in intercultural communication is the study of the influence of the setting or environment on the success or failure of communication. Four, when you are asked to picture a classroom in your mind's eye, what do you see? Five, 
The classroom as we know it, by the way, is a relatively recent innovation. Okay, so communication can take the form of talk or it can take the form of gestures. Um, we, with this particular verb, we have to be careful. So we gesture. We gesture towards an object. So we gesture towards an object. But we gesture to a person. So we gesture towards an object. He gestures towards the door and we left. So he gestured towards the door and we left. So he gestured to the old man in the corner. So we gestured towards an object. He gestured towards the door, gestured towards the uh, the bar, gestured towards the restaurant. But if it's a person, we gestured to. He gestured to the old man sat in the corner. He would gesture towards the corner and gesture to the old man sat in the corner. So gesture to a person, gesture towards an object. Many scholars, which is where we get the word school from, so scholars and scholastic, um, we have this idea of studying. Uh, many scholars study the topic of communication in general uh, in order to learn how individuals send and interpret. Interpret has two meanings here. In general conversation, commonly, we would say to interpret means to make sense of something, uh, to make sense of something. Um, so we would have to interpret um, and it will be, um, so you would say that uh, many Um, if something is, as, as we say, ambiguous, we have this word ambig. Uh, I'm sorry, ambiguous. If something is ambiguous, it means it is open to interpretation. So uh, an interpretation is to make sense of something in a, um, a, a personal sense, and then that will mostly be an accepted interpretation. So if something is ambiguous, it is open to interpretation, which means there's a certain level of ambiguity uh, to a statement. So for example, if someone says, um, you must have the correct attitude, um, correct attitude is, as we say, open to interpretation. I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really, it's not really too specific about what the correct attitude is. Uh, so that's open to interpretation. In language, we would say that interpreting, interpreting is spoken language. So uh, oftentimes you'll have two people who don't share a common language and a third person will interpret between those two people. So interpreting is with the spoken language. And we say that translation is, with, is in the written language. So we don't say, uh, when someone translates a book, for example, we don't say interpret a book. We have to, when you, in, the idea is that in that sense, uh, to interpret a book means to make sense of the book. So a translation is the written language going from one language to the other. And interpreting is going from one spoken form of the language to the other. So if you want to go and do your uh, translation exam, please make sure that you don't sign up for the interpreting exam. It's um, a little bit different, a little bit different, and a little bit uh, um, uh, more complicated. Interestingly, the French they don't say play a role. 
in movies or in theater, um, they actually will say interpret a role. So um, there's, there's a lot more seriousness uh, for French actors. Um, French actors interpret a role, they don't play a role. One area of research in intercultural communication. Again, we've seen this intercultural, this international. We have al the suffix, and we have inter is the prefix. But the setting or environment. So the setting can mean the environment. Um, in films, novels, sorry, films and movies, films, novels, and plays, um, the setting is the time and location of the play. Um, so we say the movie. So the movie is set in the American West in the 1800s. That would be the setting. When you are asked to picture a classroom in your mind's eye, what do you see? So we have your mind's eye. And you are always asked to picture a something in your mind's eye, is the sentence pattern. We always say this picture to imagine. And the classroom as we know it is a relatively recent innovation. Again, French word, uh, T-I-O-N at the end. Here are sentences 6 to 10. 6. In particular, Culture influences the rituals that take place in the classroom setting and the ways that students participate in the classroom discourse. 7. Rituals are systematic procedures used to perform a certain act or to communicate a certain message. 8. In some graduate level seminars in American universities, students do not make any physical signs when they want to speak. They state their ideas whenever they feel the urge. 9. North American students from families of European origin are usually more talkative in class and more willing to state their opinions than are students of American Indian heritage or from Asian backgrounds. 10. The esteem in which teachers are held also varies from culture to culture. And one more time. Six, in particular, culture influences the rituals that take place in the classroom setting and the ways that students participate in the classroom discourse. Seven, rituals are systematic procedures used to perform a certain act or to communicate a certain message. Eight, in some graduate level seminars in American universities, students do not make any physical signs when they want to speak. They state their ideas whenever they feel the urge. 9. North American students from families of European origin are usually more talkative in class and more willing to state their opinions than are students of American Indian heritage or from Asian backgrounds. 10. The esteem in which teachers are held also varies from culture to culture. Okay, so culture influences the rituals that take place in the classroom setting and the ways that students participate in the classroom discourse. Discourse just being another word for, um, we get the word discussion from this. Um, discourse just means uh, uh, people having a conversation. So um, obviously discourse and discussion, we see some relation between that. Um, usually um, talking about serious uh, academic topics. Uh, systematic means to do something step by step 
So we don't really do something step by step in academic English. We do things systematically. Feel the urge. You can also say feel the need. And we would use whenever. And then the infinitive at the end. So whenever you feel the need, or whenever you feel the urge to say something, then please do. So we just have that. So uh, that's that sentence pattern there. Um, origin, heritage, and background. These are all ways of talking about um, ethnic origin or ethnicity. So you can have origin, heritage, or background. And the esteem, um, this esteem comes from the word estimation. Which is just really an old-fashioned way, way of saying, in my opinion. In my estimation, he's the best teacher there is. He's held in. And we hold people in high esteem. So um, esteem and held or hold um, co-locate together. We don't say he is in high esteem. He is held in high esteem. Okay, so rhetorical questions here, just a brief word. Uh, rhetorical questions are questions that are asked by the speaker, but um, the speaker does not ex expect anybody to answer it. Um, the speaker will answer the rhetorical question immediately after he answers, uh, he asks the question. So um, normally, um, it's it's a way of adding cohesion and creating a connection with the audience because it, uh, it introduces a point at the right time um, that the audience will be asking um, the same question, hopefully. So um, people that are following along, um, the lecture will be structured in such a way that the answer is not obvious. And uh, the question will be, uh, it, it's pretty obvious that the, uh, the audience will be asking the question uh, that the speaker will ask rhetorically. So it, the speaker may withhold some information from the audience so that he knows that at the right time, at a certain point, the audience will be asking, uh, how did you find this out? And then the uh, speaker will anticipate this question and ask it without expecting an answer. So he'll say, so how do we know this? How did we find this out? Well, and oftentimes you'll find nine times out of 10, um, the speaker will answer the rhetorical question with well. So for example, How do we know this? Well, and then the answer. So um, we always use WH questions. Who, why, where, when, what, and how. And these are the only time, these are the only rhetorical questions that we can, we can ask. So we always create rhetorical questions with who, why, what, when, were, how. Um, have you ever is not rhetorical. So we always ask a rhetorical question, who, why, were, when, what, how. Have you ever, I need to tell you this very, very clearly, 
um, is not rhetorical. It is not a rhetorical question because the answer will always change. Um, so have you ever been skydiving? You're asking about experience. You're not asking about something um, to introduce a main point here. So uh, I, I know that you're often tempted to use this in writing. Uh, you're often tempted to use this in speeches, but you shouldn't be using have you ever uh, to so-called create interest. Um, it is not a rhetorical question because um, the answer will change um, depending on the experience of the people that you are asking. When you ask a rhetorical question, it has to um, introduce a supplemental point or it has to introduce a main point. And it has to be a question which is anticipated that other people will want to know the answer to. So rhetorical questions, we need to have some sense of anticipation. I knew you would ask that. Or you're probably asking yourself, how do we know that? So uh, the idea with rhetorical questions is that it introduces a main point. And it's also a question that the speaker anticipates that the audience will be asking at the same time. So we only use who, why, what, when, where, how. We never use have you ever as a rhetorical device because it simply isn't rhetorical. Um, the answer will vary greatly from individual to individual and it will have nothing to do with the main point of what you are talking about or what the lecturer is talking about. So have you ever questions are never rhetorical. It has to be who, why, what, when, where, how. And it's always an anticipated question, usually because the lecturer has withheld some information in order to create some interest in the lecture. So you can hear, you will hear from, you'll, pr you'll probably be asking yourself, basically we know this from, and the definition of, I'll give you a dictionary def definition of, we will, uh, we will hear all of these cues. So it's always WH, 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 WH. What exactly is, when, what, where do you go for this? Well, it will always be those WH questions. Never have you ever. Have you ever is not rhetorical. It doesn't introduce a main point. It doesn't introduce a point that's going to be developed. And uh, it's not an anticipated uh, question. In your notes, you will simply write Q and A. So what is culture? Well, it's a systematic, it's a system of knowledge for communicating between other people, interpreting uh, verbal and nonverbal behavior. And we need to put these things on the, um, we put these points on their own line in your notes. And we also put them in the same level of indentation because they are just as important as um, the previous point. So this is criteria. It is a criteria which is of equal importance. So what is culture? Well, it's a system of knowledge for communicating with others and interpreting verbal and nonverbal behavior. Because these, these criteria here are equally important, we put them on the same level of indentation here. But for putting these rhetorical questions in your notes, you simply write Q and then the colon, what is culture, and then answer the system of knowledge for. So that's how you would record it in your notes. So, but what do we mean by culture? Basically, culture reminds us, provides us with a system of knowledge that allows us to communicate with others and teaches us how to interpret their verbal and nonverbal behavior. Q, what is culture? Answer, system of knowledge for, and then the list of criteria of what it's for. So recording rhetorical questions, Q is the question and A is the answer.
So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on uh, We need to get to the lecture here. But what x is a classroom? Ans influ by coat and inclu teach stood rel. How info taught and learned. How teach stood com. So what is a classroom? What exactly is a classroom? The answer is influenced by culture and includes teacher-student relationships, how information is taught and learned, how teachers and students communicate. And we see the main point, answer is influenced by culture, and the elements of this answer, we need to look at the teacher-student relationship, how information is taught by the teacher, how it's learned by the student, and how teachers and students communicate. So these three elements of criteria, of the criteria here, are just as important as uh, one another, and they have to be um, equally indented in the list that you have here. So just listen out for the intonation in this audio. We will always have, because it's a WH question, so uh, what time is it? It will always be, what's your name? It will always be a form of information. What time is it? What's your name? Where are you from? How do we know this? It will always be falling intonation. And then we have rising intonation for the answer. So just listen out for that in this example. Today's lecture deals with language, culture, and communication in classrooms. First of all, what exactly is communication? One definition is that communication is a form of human behavior that results from a need to interact with other human beings. So, to meet this need, we send verbal and nonverbal messages to communicate with both friends and strangers. Communication can take the form of talk, or it can take the form of gestures or nonverbal signals of one kind or another. The talk or signals send messages that communicate a person's thoughts, feelings, and intentions to others. Let me just listen again. Today's lecture deals with language, culture, and communication in classrooms. First of all, what exactly is communication? One definition is that communication is a form of human behavior that results from a need to interact with other human beings. So, to meet this need, we send verbal and nonverbal messages to communicate with both friends and strangers. Communication can take the form of talk, or it can take the form of gestures or nonverbal signals of one kind or another. The talk or signals send messages that communicate a person's thoughts, feelings and intentions to others. So uh, what exactly is communication? So we have that falling intonation. There. What is that? What exactly is communication? Well, human behavior it results in a need to interact with each other. Send verbal, nonverbal messages resulting in communication with friends and uh, sorry, uh, cause We've got that cause and effect there. Communication with friends and strangers. Talk, gestures, nonverbal uh, signs results in communication, uh, people's thoughts, feelings, and intentions. So the, the important thing that you need to um, make sure that you're hearing, um, if you're not hearing it, then try practice saying it to uh, make sure that you get the, uh, get the tones right there and the... Uh, what exactly is communication? Because it's doubly wage, it has to go down at the end. And then that will signify the end of the question and the start of the answer. But I think this note taking is fairly easy to grasp. It's just the actual, um, just the actual intonation, which is uh, difficult. Okay, so we have our five slides again. Um, we have rituals, what is a classroom? Language, culture, and communication, treatment of teachers, and classroom participation. So you may actually be able to um, see some uh, just by looking at the titles 
um, you might be actually uh, be able to see a logical I hope you'll be able to see by now um, a logical grouping of the slides at least what might be the first slide and what might be the last slide um, that would be something to look for and then you can look at the individual detail so I'll play this uh, recording as uh, as we always do uh, we'll go through it once just try to put these slides into the right order uh, as you hear them in the lecture and then we'll uh, look at the individual questions. Today's lecture deals with language, culture, and communication in classrooms. First of all, what exactly is communication? One definition is that communication is a form of human behavior that results from a need to interact with other human beings. So, to meet this need, we send verbal and nonverbal messages to communicate with both friends and strangers. Communication can take the form of talk, or it can take the form of gestures or nonverbal signals of one kind or another. The talk or signals send messages that communicate a person's thoughts, feelings, and intentions to others. Many scholars study the topic of communication in general and speech communication specifically in order to learn how individuals send and interpret messages. Some of these scholars conduct research on the topic of intercultural communication. That is, they study communication between people from different cultures. One area of research in intercultural communication is the study of the influence of the setting or environment on the success or failure of communication. In this lecture, I'll be talking about one specific aspect of intercultural communication. That is, intercultural communication that takes place in the classroom. But what exactly is a classroom? When you're asked to picture a classroom in your mind's eye, what do you see? You probably see a classroom that is familiar to you and that would be familiar to students from your culture. Not everyone will see the same picture in their minds. Although many people have a similar mental image of a classroom, their culture greatly influences the way they view the teacher-student relationship. And culture also influences how a person understands the ways in which information is taught and learned in the classroom. Culture also plays an important role in determining how teachers and students communicate in the classroom. In this lecture, I'll give you a few examples of some of the ways that culture affects this communication. The classroom, as we know it, by the way, is a relatively recent innovation. Great teachers like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Confucius taught without the benefit of a board, desks, and the standard comforts or discomforts of a classroom building. But let me return to the main topic of this lecture, the influence of culture on behavior and communication between teacher and students in the classroom. If you've come from another culture to study in the United States, you may already have noticed that teachers and students in American schools interact and communicate in the classroom in ways that differ from how teachers and students communicate in your home culture. It's culture that influences and establishes these interactions and communication patterns. But what do we mean by culture? Of course, culture is a term that is used in many different ways. Basically, culture provides us with a system of knowledge that allows us to communicate with others and teaches us how to interpret their verbal and nonverbal behavior. Culture influences and establishes how people interact with one another or do not interact with one another. In particular, culture influences the rituals that take place in the classroom setting and it influences the ways that students participate in the classroom discourse. It also influences the esteem in which teachers are held. 
Just what exactly are rituals? I'll give you a dictionary definition to begin with. Rituals are systematic procedures used to perform a certain act or to communicate a certain message. Well, there are many rituals associated with teaching and learning and with education in general. In some countries, when a teacher enters the classroom, the students ritually stand up. In the United States, a classroom ritual occurs when students raise their hands to signal to the teacher that they know the answer to a question. This hand raising is not a universal classroom ritual to signal intent to answer a question, however. Jamaican students snap or flap their fingers to signal that they want to answer a question. In some college and graduate level seminars in American universities, Students do not make any physical signs when they want to speak. They state their ideas whenever they feel the urge or when it is appropriate. This sort of classroom behavior is especially confusing to students from cultures in which there are no rituals for attracting the teacher's attention because the student is not expected to participate in the class at all. This brings us to the issue of classroom participation. North American students from families of European origin are usually more talkative in class and more willing to state their opinions than are students of American Indian heritage or from Asian backgrounds. This difference is directly related to cultural values about learning and education and classroom behavior. European American students' culture teaches them that learning is shaped and helped by their talk and active engagement in exploring or discussing issues. Some Asian-born and Asian-American students, however, are generally taught that they will learn best by listening to and absorbing the knowledge being given to them by the teacher. So, some cultures do not have a way for students to signal a desire to talk to a teacher. In these cultures, students speak out only after the teacher has spoken to them. And what about how teachers are treated? How much are they respected? The esteem in which teachers are held also varies from culture to culture. Many Asian peoples see the teacher, the instructor, the professor as the very symbol of learning and culture. In Germany, Students value the personal opinions of their instructors, and it is not customary to disagree with or contradict a teacher during class. Israeli students, on the other hand, might criticize a teacher who they feel is wrong about an issue or who they believe has provided incorrect information. There are many other ways that culture can affect interaction and communication between teachers and students in the classroom. I've discussed differences in how students get the teacher's attention during class, and I've pointed out the differences in the way students from various cultures participate and communicate with the teacher during class. From this brief consideration of classroom communication, you should begin to see that learning a language involves more than studying the vocabulary, idioms, and grammar of the language. If you are to succeed in communicating in a second language classroom, you need to learn not only the language spoken in the classroom, but also the expected procedures of classroom participation and communication. That is, the rituals of language, culture, and communication. Okay, so uh, slide number one is language culture and communication slide number two what is a classroom slide number three rituals slide four classroom participation and slide five treatment of teachers Okay, so let's take a look at the individual questions and the main points that are being discussed in each of these slides. So, uh, slide one, language, culture and communication. Question is, how do people communicate their thoughts, feelings and intentions to others? 
Today's lecture deals with language, culture, and communication in classrooms. First of all, what exactly is communication? One definition is that communication is a form of human behavior that results from a need to interact with other human beings. So, to meet this need, we send verbal and nonverbal messages to communicate with both friends and strangers. Communication can take the form of talk, or it can take the form of gestures or nonverbal signals of one kind or another. The talk or signals send messages that communicate a person's thoughts, feelings, and intentions to others. Many scholars study the topic of communication in general and speech communication specifically in order to learn how individuals send and interpret messages. Some of these scholars conduct research on the topic of intercultural communication, that is, they study communication between people from different cultures. One area of research in intercultural communication is the study of the influence of the setting or environment on the success or failure of communication. In this lecture, I'll be talking about one specific aspect of intercultural communication, that is, intercultural communication that takes place in the classroom. Okay, so how do people communicate their feelings, thoughts, and intentions to others? Probably you'd be able to get the answer here. Uh, they talk or use gestures to communicate their thoughts, feelings, and intentions to others. Talking and using gestures. I just lost my place there. Uh, slide number two. What influences the image people have of a classroom? But what exactly is a classroom? When you're asked to picture a classroom in your mind's eye, what do you see? You probably see a classroom that is familiar to you and that would be familiar to students from your culture. Not everyone will see the same picture in their minds. Although many people have a similar mental image of a classroom, their culture greatly influences the way they view the teacher-student relationship. And culture also influences how a person understands the ways in which information is taught and learned in the classroom. Culture also plays an important role in determining how teachers and students communicate in the classroom. In this lecture, I'll give you a few examples of some of the ways that culture affects this communication. The classroom as we know it, by the way, is a relatively recent innovation. Great teachers like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Confucius taught without the benefit of a board, desks, and the standard comforts or discomforts of a classroom building. But let me return to the main topic of this lecture, the influence of culture on behavior and communication between teacher and students in the classroom. If you've come from another culture to study in the United States, you may already have noticed that teachers and students in American schools interact and communicate in the classroom in ways that differ from how teachers and students communicate in your home culture. It's culture that influences and establishes these interactions and communication patterns. Okay, so what influences the image people have of the classroom? Surprisingly, uh, as we've just learned, uh, the culture influences uh, the image that people have of a classroom.
Slide number three, how do Jamaican students signal that they want to answer a question? But what do we mean by culture? Of course, culture is a term that is used in many different ways. Basically, culture provides us with a system of knowledge that allows us to communicate with others and teaches us how to interpret their verbal and nonverbal behavior. Culture influences and establishes how people interact with one another or do not interact with one another. In particular, culture influences the rituals that take place in the classroom setting, and it influences the ways that students participate in the classroom discourse. It also influences the esteem in which teachers are held. Say that one more time. It's short and sweet, fairly obvious as well. Yeah. But what do we mean by culture? Of course, culture is a term that is used in many different ways. Basically, culture provides us with a system of knowledge that allows us to communicate with others and teaches us how to interpret their verbal and nonverbal behavior. Culture influences and establishes how people interact with one another or do not interact with one another. In particular, culture influences the rituals that take place in the classroom setting, and it influences the ways that students participate in the classroom discourse. It also influences the esteem in which teachers are held. Anybody got that from the, from the recording? I mean, this is a mistake in the in the, in the book here. Uh, so the answer is not actually there. But I think you got it from the. Uh, you could get it from the. Uh, from the actual uh, first listening, uh, this snap off laptop thing is, uh, um, it looks like um, slides three and four have been swapped over unfortunately so sorry about that but uh, you got it from the first listening i think so that's not in there uh, which north american students are the more talkative in class sorry i can't find my just what exactly are rituals? I'll give you a dictionary definition to begin with. Rituals are systematic procedures used to perform a certain act or to communicate a certain message. Well, there are many rituals associated with teaching and learning and with education in general. In some countries, when a teacher enters the classroom, the students ritually stand up. In the United States, a classroom ritual occurs when students raise their hands to signal to the teacher that they know the answer to a question. This hand-raising is not a universal classroom ritual to signal intent to answer a question, however. Jamaican students snap or flap their fingers to signal that they want to answer a question. In some college and graduate-level seminars in American universities, Students do not make any physical signs when they want to speak. They state their ideas whenever they feel the urge or when it is appropriate. This sort of classroom behavior is especially confusing to students from cultures in which there are no rituals for attracting the teacher's attention because the student is not expected to participate in the class at all. This brings us to the issue of classroom participation. North American students from families of European origin are usually more talkative in class and more willing to state their opinions than are students of American Indian heritage or from Asian backgrounds. This difference is directly related to cultural values about learning and education and classroom behavior. European American students' culture teaches them that learning is shaped and helped by their talk and active engagement in exploring or discussing issues. 
Some Asian-born and Asian-American students, however, are generally taught that they will learn best by listening to and absorbing the knowledge being given to them by the teacher. So, some cultures do not have a way for students to signal a desire to talk to a teacher. In these cultures, students speak out only after the teacher has spoken to them. Okay, so which North American students are the more talkative in class? They are the ones from a European background, I think. The students from families of European origin. And finally, slide five. In which country or region do students sometimes criticize their teachers? And what about how teachers are treated? How much are they respected? The esteem in which teachers are held also varies from culture to culture. Many Asian peoples see the teacher, the instructor, the professor as the very symbol of learning and culture. In Germany, students value the personal opinions of their instructors, and it is not customary to disagree with or contradict a teacher during class. Israeli students, on the other hand, might criticize a teacher who they feel is wrong about an issue or who they believe has provided incorrect information. There are many other ways that culture can affect interaction and communication between teachers and students in the classroom. I've discussed differences in how students get the teacher's attention during class, and I've pointed out the differences in the ways students from various cultures participate and communicate with the teacher during class. From this brief consideration of classroom communication, you should begin to see that learning a language involves more than studying the vocabulary, idioms, and grammar of the language. If you are to succeed in communicating in a second language classroom, you need to learn not only the language spoken in the classroom, but also the expected procedures of classroom participation and communication. That is, the rituals of language, culture, and communication. Okay, so in which country or region do students sometimes criticize their teachers in class? And the answer was, it certainly wasn't the, uh, presume it's a Japanese classroom here, um, Israel. Um, not many people have uh, experience of an Israeli education system, unfortunately. So we'll just see if we can get a look at some of these uh, examples of. Uh, uh, Good note taking. So we have, um, I'll just give you the first one here. So we have A, B, and C. Uh, so we have the audio here, and then the mentor, um, who's, I guess, is uh, taking over my job, uh, will explain why this is the uh, better set of notes. Part one. But what do we mean by culture? Of course, culture is a term that is used in many different ways. Basically, culture provides us with a system of knowledge that allows us to communicate with others and teaches us how to interpret their verbal and nonverbal behavior. Culture influences and establishes how people interact with one another or do not interact with one another. Look at number one. Which notes are similar to your notes? Did you notice the rhetorical question and use the symbols Q and A? All three of the notes use Q and A, which is good. However, in C, the question is written out exactly as it was spoken. Try to reduce a rhetorical question to its basic meaning, as in A and B. Although C accurately reflects the definition of culture from the lecture, too much is written down. There is no need to write down basic or us. If your notes look like C, you've got the idea, but you need to put only the most important information in your notes. Now let's look at A and B. Which one most clearly shows the definition of culture? In B, 
It seems as if the lecturer gave three different definitions of culture. This is confusing. In fact, the lecturer gave just one definition that contained three key points. My notes are A. These notes clearly show one definition of culture that has three parts. Okay, so uh, let's see if you can uh, see if you can decide here between A, B, and C. Now, which would be the best set of notes? I don't know if uh, your notes don't match exactly, but which of these examples do you think would be uh, the best set of notes? Let me play the audio again, and then um, there'll be an explanation as to why one is uh, better than the other. Part two. Just what exactly are rituals? I'll give you a dictionary definition to begin with. Rituals are systematic procedures used to perform a certain act or to communicate a certain message. Well, there are many rituals associated with teaching and learning and with education in general. In some countries, when a teacher enters the classroom, the students ritually stand up. Look at number two. Which notes are similar to your notes? Did you notice the rhetorical question and use the Q&A symbols, as in A and C? If so, good. Although B includes all of the information, it is not as clear as A or C. In B, the fact that rituals are a main point in the lecture gets lost. And in B, it is not visually clear that standing up when a teacher comes in the room is an example of a ritual. No example is given in A. Including the example, as in C, makes the somewhat technical definition of rituals easier to understand. The notes in C are mine. A little bit of a complicated explanation there, but if you look at C, uh, we have the Q and then we have the A, so we have what exactly are rituals, and then we have the definition, and then we have uh, an example. So we don't really need the, uh, we, we uh, in B, the dictionary definition of rituals, it seems a little bit out of place and out of context to have that without the context of the rhetorical question. So you're probably give, getting the idea now, hopefully, that English tends to be a lot more direct and a lot, you have to really explain a lot more. So um, from your Chinese language point of view, there may be a lot of redundancy um, here, but you have to understand that this is just the way that English, uh, the kind of the precise nature of English and German as well, uh, needs to be in uh, written and spoken language. So uh, we'll wrap up the ladies and gentlemen, I think, because uh, it is, uh, I've got 29 minutes past, so it must be near half past right now. So uh, next class, next Friday, sorry, not next class, is uh, Dragon Boat Festival. And there will be no class then. And then the, uh, the following Friday after that uh, will be the final exam. Okay, so unfortunately, it's a little bit, I've had nothing to do with this, so please don't blame me. Uh, these are uh, decisions that are made by the uh, Chinese administration. Um, I've had no consultation whatsoever, so I'm just as rushed as uh, everybody else is with this one. So, unfortunately, the uh, the final exam has been moved forward a week, so it's no longer on the twenty first. So the next time I see you will be uh, for the final exam. The only good thing that I can say is that you guys have escaped the taupe uh, for this semester. So that's a little bit of a relief. Um, unfortunately, everything rests uh, on the final exam performance now. So hope you try and enjoy uh, the weekend and Dragon Boat Festival, and I'll see you at the final. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.